<laughs> Senator Kennedy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, ladies. You'll get used to the yell. You want to come over here? <laughs> it's happened over, uh, Senator Tillis is keeping count. It's happened over 200 times in the last three days. It's not really how democracy is supposed to work. Uh, Judge, I, I, I will, will repeat what I said yesterday. I, uh, I'm not going to ask you to give me a hint about how you might vote on the court if you're confirmed. I certainly don't want you to violate the judicial canons of ethics, and I, I may have to gently interrupt you a few times to kind of move you along or move me along. Uh, yesterday, you started to talk about Justice Harlan and his feeling about uh, whether he should vote in a political election, and somehow we ran out of time, and I thought I'd give you an opportunity to finish that thought. Thank you, Senator. And uh, one of the things that we have to do as judges, as I've emphasized many times in this hearing, uh, is maintain the independence of the federal judiciary, independence from politics, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, independence from political influence or public pressure or public influence. And part of that, part of the canons for federal judges, federal judiciary, is that we don't attend political rallies, we don't, we're not allowed to uh, donate to political campaigns, support political candidates, put bumper stickers on our cars, signs in our yards, uh, and one of the things I decided, we, we are allowed technically to vote, uh, but one of the things I decided after I voted in the first election, and, and I, I read something about how the second Justice Harlan had decided not to vote in elections because he thought that uh, reinforced the independence that he felt as a judge. And I thought about that and I decided to follow that lead. I'm not saying my approach is right and other judges take a different approach on that and I fully respect that. But for me, it just felt uh, uh, more consistent for me with the independence of the judiciary not to, uh, not to vote because I've always considered voting a sacred uh, responsibility and one in which I think very deeply about the policies I'm supporting and the people I'm supporting and that seemed uh, almost as if I were taking policy views, at least to myself, into the voting booth, and I didn't want to do that as a judge. So I decided to follow the lead of the second Justice Harlan. I'll be the first to say I'm not the second Justice Harlan. He was a great justice on the Supreme Court and someone, uh, of course, who I would be, uh, if I were to be the con confirmed honor to be on that court and follow in his so you lead. Don't, you don't vote in political elections? I do not vote in political elections. Interesting. Um, last night you talked uh, a little bit about your outreach efforts to attract more uh, women and minority law clerks. Mm -hmm. Could you quickly go through that for me again? I think I was getting coffee when you were <laughs> talking about that. Senator, one of the uh, uh, issues in American society generally, of course, but also in the judiciary in particular, has been to advance, uh, to overcome the discriminatory history of the, of the uh, country and to help advance the cause of women and minorities in the legal profession. And one of the, one of the areas where that's revealed itself is law clerk hiring. And one of the, and that's important because the law, we get- Law four, clerks for judges, you mean. Yeah, we, law clerks for judges. We get, we get four law clerks each year, and they're there for just one year, and then they turn over after a year. They're like a team. They turn over after the year, and you get a new team of four the next year. Those law clerks are among the best and brightest out of American law schools, and they often will go on to uh, leadership positions in the, in the Congress or in the state legislatures or- in the judiciary or in the bar or in public service. And so those are important training positions for the future leaders of America. And there's been, there was um, disparities uh, when I came on the bench in the number of women uh, and minorities. So I decided to be very proactive about that. There was a problem identified. I decided to be proactive. So uh, on the women law clerk front, I'm very proud of that of my 48 law clerks, a majority of them have been women, uh, and they're the best and brightest. 
uh, and uh, one of them was just confirmed as a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, Britt Grant, uh, and, and she was in my second uh, class of clerks. Uh, that's important because as my mom, uh, as I talked about my mom, my mom was a trailblazer in the law and overcame barriers to help uh, women achieve equality in the law, and I want to do my part as well. Uh, not just because of her, I would, but she was an example to help achieve equality for all women to give them a equal place at the table and future opportunities. And I think I've, I've helped one small, I'm just one small piece and I don't want to overdo it, but I've tried to be proactive about it and to make a difference. So too- What about minority outreach? Right, so uh, in 2009 or 2010, so after I was on the court for about three years, um, there was a hearing, I think, in the House Appropriations Committee with uh, the two justices usually go up every year and talk about the Supreme Court budget and testify before the Appropriations Committee to get money or to explain the need for money for the Supreme Court for the following year. And Justice Thomas and Justice Breyer were there that year, and they were asked about the uh, seeming disparity with minority law clerks in general, African-American law clerks in particular, and one of the things they said, and they were talking about Supreme Court law clerks, those law clerks for the Supreme Court justices. And one of the things they said was they hired from the lower courts, from the courts of appeals. And they pointed out that the pool uh, in the courts of appeals was had the disparities, and so they were really dependent on what the court of appeals uh, did and, and does. I took that as a bit of a call to action to... Uh, do something about it myself. And what did you do, Judge? Uh, I, st I, I reached out uh, initially to the Black Law Students Association at Yale Law School, uh, emailed them and asked them if I could come talk to them. Uh, Yale Law School is a, a school that um, produces a lot of law clerks, so I thought, and it's my alma mater, I start there, and I went and uh, spoke to them. What I did is I went and spoke to the group, and I explained to them the importance of clerking. I encouraged them to clerk. I explained the history of the disparities. Uh, then I gave them, uh, in essence, uh, what I thought were, were tips about how to make yourself a better clerk, kind of like a coach, uh, tips to how to be a better uh, clerk candidate, classes to take, uh, prof professors, uh, how to deal with you, professors. Do you think that helped? Uh, I do think it helped. I, I was uh, uncertain, frankly. Sure. <laughs> when I walked into the room, how that would work. And it worked great in terms of the reaction I got and also in terms of, I think, the real world results. Uh, the way I thought about it is that if I make even a, a difference for one clerk or one student, it's, it's worth it. Sure. And I think I did for more and then I've kept it up year after year. I've done it also where I teach at Harvard Law School and uh, I'm proud of the, uh, the results, uh, I think, I think it's made, uh, you know, again, a small difference, but it's one person at a time, one clerk at a time, one student at a time. And I think hopefully by talking about it in this forum, uh, I can encourage uh, more efforts of that nature, which are really just recruiting efforts and explanation for uh, many of the students uh, at law schools or first generation professionals and don't have the networks necessarily that others do. And so to, I, I know we could, we could, uh, you, I can tell you enjoy talking about I it. I could go for about two hours on that, but yes, hours. Senator, I thank you for and cutting I'll me off. I'll be glad to go if the chairman will give me two hours, <laughs> but I don't think he will. Yeah. Um, ha have, um, I know you've read an opinion before where you, you agree with the conclusion, but, but, uh, you don't agree with the reasoning. Yeah. Have you had that experience? I, I have. Yeah, I think we all have. Yes. H here's why I said, can you tell me what in God's name a penumbra is? <laughs> Senator, the, the Supreme Court, as I think you're referring to, once used that term, uh, but it, it doesn't use that term anymore for figuring out what otherwise unenumerated rights are protected by the Constitution of the United States. What it refers to now is a test in the Glucksburg case, and Justice Kagan talked about this in her confirmation hearing when she was sitting in this seat. The Glucksburg case uh, sets forth a test where unenumerated rights will be recognized if they're rooted in history and tradition. And why that matters, I think, to your point... Can I stop you? It's deeply rooted. Yes. And is that... 
is that uh, are those roots that are that are just deep? Are those roots that are deep that have been growing there a long time? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm asking? Is it? I fear I don't. Well, uh, I, I, yeah, that's <laughs> that's my fault, not yours. Um, is it a, is it is it something that Americans have cherished for a long time, or can it be something that is a is a is a moray of contemporary society? So, when the court has referred to deeply rooted in history and tradition, it is it has looked to history. Now, how deep the history must be is there, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to that and how much contemporary practice matters. I also don't think there's a one size fits all. But the important thing is the court, and again, Justice Kagan emphasized this in her hearing, that the Clarksburg test means that the court is not simply doing what your role is, which is to figure out the best policy and to enshrine it uh, into the law, in the Constitution, in the case of the court, but rather is looking for as best it can objective indi indicia of rights that are not explicitly enumerated in the Constitution, but that are nonetheless protected. The best example, I think, is the Pierce case. Oregon passed a law saying that everyone, and this is in the 1920s, saying that everyone in the state of Oregon, every student had to attend a public school and could not attend a parochial or private school. And parents who wanted to send their uh, children to a Catholic, or child to a Catholic school sued and argued that that violated the United States Constitution. It made it to the Supreme Court. Uh, the right, in essence, the claimed right was the right of parents to direct the upbringing of their children by sending them to a private or parochial school. And the Supreme Court affirmed and recognized that right under the United States Constitution, but even what, though not. What is, and that is a good example, Judge. And again, I apologize for interrupting, but we're, we're dealing here with values, are we not? That we all cherish together as Americans, like the rule of law or privacy or equal opportunity or personal responsibility. Um, how do you determine what values all Americans cherish? How, how do nine people determine what values all Americans cherish, cherish enough to read into or to discover as a result of the superior intellect of those nine individuals is a part of the Constitution and has been there for a long time. But most of us couldn't see it except the nine justices. Well, I, I don't think that's the conception of the judicial role that the Supreme Court has articulated. I agree, but that's the perception that some people have. And perception is important in, well, in, in, in appreciation of government. Well, I agree with you uh, that the, the values question is one that, of course, is first and foremost uh, for Congress to figure out the policy or the state legislatures. Judges, federal judges, the Supreme Court, were not uh, supposed to be, I think consistent with your question, simply importing our own values into the Constitution. It's not just to, supposed to be five people. Uh, we're, we're five people like every other American. We don't have uh, a charter to uh, create new rights uh, just because we think they're best. Rather, we find them... Excuse in me again for interrupting, but I think Justice Scalia would say and has said that no disrespect, but that, that um, uh, five people, whomever they may be on the United States Supreme Court, can establish this value um, and, and, and that their their sense of, of morality or, or their value system is no better or worse than picking out, picking the first five names in the Washington, D.C. phone book. <laughs> yeah, he, he did say uh, that, and I think that is a comment that I think is shared by the justices on the Supreme Court and is reflected now in the, uh, in the uh, Glucksburg test. But I recognize uh, that they're it's important to explain that to people so that people don't get confused about our role. Our role is rooted in law. It's rooted in precedent. It's rooted in not our values per se, but the values reflected either in the Constitution or reflected in the legislation passed by Congress. And I realize there are gray areas in what I'm just saying, but it's very important to, 
to and, and, explain that And here's that my point. People. Excuse me again for interrupting. Um, I, I will bet most Americans could agree today and will agree that, that we have a privacy right. We have search and seizure privacy is important, but we also believe now that disclosure privacy mm -hmm. is important. Uh, autonomy privacy is important. Yeah. And it's part of our Constitution. And frankly, I'm glad that it is. Mm -hmm. But how it got there matters. How it got there matters. Mm -hmm. It's not just the end result. Let, let me leave that for a second. I, I agree with that. Um, and, and just kind of shift gears. I've just got a few minutes left. Um, I can tell from your testimony the last three days or two days that um, high school was, those were formative years for you. You went to Georgetown Preparatory School? I did Georgetown Prep, uh, Jesuit High School here. Uh, um, it was very formative. What was it like for you? What were you like? Were you, uh, <laughs> did you ever get in trouble? Did you, were you more of a John Boy Walton type or a Ferris Bueller type? Uh, these ladies are old enough to understand. Uh, I love sports, uh, first and foremost. I think that uh, I, I worked hard at school. I had a lot of friends. I've talked a lot about my friends. Yeah. Uh, and they've been here. Uh, so it was, it was very formative. Uh, and when I think back on it. You left uh, out the trouble part. I was waiting for that. Um, right. So that, that's encompassed under the friends, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were an athlete? Yes, I played uh, football and basketball. My coach, my football coach was uh, named Jim Fagan. Uh, and he's a legendary uh, football coach. And. So over the last uh, eight weeks where I've been in a slightly different situation than I'd been for the previous 53 years, I've, uh, in terms of where I can go freely, I've been uh, working out on weekends at my old high school and running on the track and uh, ran into him out there. It was awesome to run into him. Uh, he still helps out with the football team and he sent me a text three nights ago. So it's awesome. Okay. That's all I'm going to get out of you, isn't it? I understand. All right. Let me yield back. Strike that, Mr. Chairman. I'm just, just in case this, we have to have the time. I'm going to reserve my two hours and ten minutes. I was, or, or, I'm, I'm sorry, my two, two, two minutes and seven seconds. <laughs> now, see, I was going to ask the judge if not him, but any of his underage running buddies had ever tried to sneak a few beers past Jesus or something like that in high school, but I'm not going to go there. Hey. I want to 